Um, tonight, what I was wanting to talk about was the sort of information that you need to start thinking about recording um, and, and the, the way in which you can do it and, and also to get you to think about how you can Im improve your understanding and, and, and get um, a bit more of an insight and perhaps even more importantly start to record information that we really don't know much about. So there's a whole suite of species out here. Not many people have studied their behaviours on Air Peninsula and for some species not many people have studied their behaviours at all. When and where they come from and go to is really quite interesting. So the first year I came here we had um, various chats, orange chats, crimson chats appearing and, and that was a really neat year for them. They were everywhere and they were breeding but I haven't really seen them much since. And, and the same is true of the woodener folk today. They were talking about that. Um, they, they, in that year we had a, a whole suite of um, wood swallows breeding here. There, there were really some neat birds and then they haven't been breeding here ever since. And trying to understand those movements and what drives it is really quite neat. Um, and really, in the end, the key information comes out of people's notebooks. It, it's when they observed them, where they observed them, how they observed them, the, the, the type of weather that was happening at that time, that a whole suite of things that in, in the end can be pulled together and make an interesting record. And ideally, um, that information is pulled together by the members of the community that collect it. And to give you an example, I'm editor of a journal called Stilt, which is the Australasian Way to Study Group um, journal. And it, it's a, a journal for all of the flyway between Alaska, Russia, right down through to Australia and New Zealand. And the papers in that are from professionals. There's, there's really high quality research papers. But at the same time, there's papers in it from members of the community who have been going out and doing bird monitoring for shorebirds for years. And they've got these lovely data sets that might be 20, 25 years long. And they tell you about the birds that have been coming and they've been going out to the same site every year doing the same sorts of surveys. And they slowly get a picture of the information. And they can write a report on that. And, and that sort of thing... If you work together as, as groups across EP, you can start to get some understanding of what's going on. The likelihood of having long-term research programs over here with professional researchers is, is not high. And if they do get to come here, it might be for two or three years for the length of a grant, and they'll come here every month for a while, and then they'll write that up and, and off they go. But as far as Air Peninsula goes, from what I can see, two or three years is just a part of what may be a much longer set of uh, events that are not predictable through to cycles of events that are predictable. Who knows? I, I, I just don't even begin to know. So getting, getting the community out there and collecting data is one thing. Getting them to store it on, on things like our biological database. So we, we, we uh, have a portal which Ben and I and, and uh, Katrina Popke helped run, which runs through the, uh, through the what's the group? It's gone. Atlas of Living Australia. Atlas of Living Australia, ALA. Um, they, they, they maintain the portal for us and, and they collect the data and we can access it at any time. That portal is, is available to all you guys and, and we'll be showing you how to use that and, and log into it in week 10 and teaching you how to put the data onto it. Um, we can access the whole data set, and we do, and we will pass it on to the Biological Database of South Australia. But at the same time, you can access it, any of you. And you can access just your data, or you can access the whole lot. So that means that in the end, 
as the data set builds up and gets more powerful in, in what it's telling you, people can look at it for all sorts of reasons, start to think about it and understand it. <coughs> so that, that starts with you having a field notebook and starting to think about what you put in it and why you put it in. So that's the sort of thing I'd like to get happening tonight. So, birding journals. Some people just use them as a checklist. You know, I've met guys who they have a list for Western Australia in June and they have a list for Western Australia in July and they have a list for Australia, all the birds they see in Australia in June and July and they have one for 1998 and one for 1999 and then they've got their world list for 1998 and 1999 and they're, they're about all the birds they can see and for, for some that's interesting and useful. In the end, it becomes quite limiting because you're really after the bird and you've seen it and you tick it and then you're off after another bird. You're not trying to collect a whole lot of information that can be useful in understanding what the bird needs. So I, I'm suggesting that there's much more that we can do. So it, it's a record that slowly builds up your skills, starting to look at the bird and starting to record the behaviours you see as well as the key identification characteristics that you pick up on. What it looks like from behind and, and the side, the type of habitat it's in. There's a whole suite of things that, that you can start to help your ID skills with. Um, make you think about the calls, and I've talked about that in previous a couple of weeks ago, what, what it is that you can record as far as the call goes and how you can help yourself start to remember the calls. And species log and ID tool. And then it, it goes beyond that. It's about the weather, it's about the location, it's about the habitat type. So I like this size book. I like it for a couple of reasons. It's bound, it's fairly water resistant to a degree. There's one that I actually have for when it's raining. It's got waterproof paper and very handy. Um, you, it doesn't matter how heavy the rain is, you just write on it, it, it all works and, and the paper just sits there and looks normal. So that's quite handy. Um, <coughs> so that's about A5. Some people like A6s type things, like to be able to fit them in their top pocket. Um, very useful. Uh, I don't like the little ring binder ones because I find that the pages rip out and, and the wind blows and they get damaged and that sort of thing. But some people love that because it just fits perfectly in their pocket. The key thing is that over the years you will build up sets of them. And it's amazing once you start writing down information how often you go back and look it up because you start to think about, ah, oh, I haven't seen that bird for ages. Last time I saw that was, hmm, um, we were down at Wanilla and it was, you know, two or three years ago and you have to flick back through it and lo and behold it's exactly the same time or, or whatever. There's, you begin to pick up on patterns of behaviour and movement. So size is important um, but not so large. The A4 books I find they're just too big, too annoying. Um, the binding, think about the binding. I like this one because it, it's reasonably well bound actually quite strong. I particularly like that it's got a elastic so the wind doesn't blow it around and I also like that there's a marker in it. I find that pretty handy. So that, that sort of thing for me is good. And then the other particular gem is that it fits in there so that when I'm out birding everything I need Used to these microphones. Okay, so be aware when you go out, have a little, take a little bit of time to think about it, and choose your choose a notebook that, that's going to be useful for you, and, and one that you are going to pick up and take out with you in the field each time. Um, the Pages, I like them lined. 
my artistic ability is about zero, so I like to be able to line things up, draw things, whatever. Some people actually prefer to be able to draw detailed diagrams of the birds and, and add bits in, and I'll talk about that in a little while. And I do that sometimes, but it's pretty rough and crude. Um, yeah, so think about the book. And then what sort of things should you immediately write in it every time you pick it up? When you're going out to do your birding, the first time you pick it up for the day, the first observation, you should be writing down the date and the time of day. That should just be automatic. You should be writing down notes on the weather. Temperature, really roughly, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. Just some idea of, of roughly what the temperature is because we know 0 to 10. It's cold. Most birds, unless there's certain conditions, will be perhaps lower in activity. Some will be even more visible because they'll be feeding more hungrily. 10 to 20, pretty good. 20 to 30, things are starting to get hot. 30 to 40, numbers of birds drop. 40 plus, what are you doing there anyway? So, you know, sort of work roughly in that, that temperature range. Visibility is important. We had that really weird day a couple of weeks ago with the smoke and the, um, the, the low, it seemed like low cloud, the light was terrible. And uh, just a note on that to explain why the numbers of birds are low. Um, statistically, when we're analysing the data you're collecting, we can allow for all of that. We can allow for the fact that this person tends to see less birds than that person. We can allow for the fact that on windy days you see less birds than on still days. All those things can be allowed for. They, and we can actually analyse correcting for each of those things. That, that's, and we, we correct for it based on the data. So if you're recording the, the wind as calm or light, and by light I typically mean you might get a few leaves moving, that sort of thing, or moderate, and by moderate I mean leaves are moving and birds become dis difficult <coughs> to see, or strong, and by strong I mean the branches are starting to move and a bird comes out of a canopy and it gets blown away. And, and those sorts of conditions are affecting how many birds you're going to count. So wind strength doesn't have to be 28 knots or whatever. It can be if you've got that sort of data available, but the just simple relative comparisons of no wind through to light wind to moderate to strong to gale force or whatever, that they're all, they all make sense and you can begin to predict on that. Light levels and cloud cover, they're closely related typically. Um, cloud cover can be just simply something like one-eighth of the sky, zero-eighths through to eight-eighths. That, that's plenty of information. And it might be just something like cumulus cloud or stratus or, or whatever. It, if, if you don't know what they are, don't, don't worry. But those, those bits of information can be useful. Um, you know, some areas, rain will reduce the amount of bird activity. Um, snow, drought. If you haven't had rain for three months, and you're still doing the same survey, just take a note, no rain for three months. Because that will be affecting what the birds are doing. Gives a bit of a background for it. <coughs> the next one's the location. I always give a name for the location, mostly because sometimes grid references and that are wrong. And you'd be amazed how many times we get a grid reference on the website that is out in South America or South Africa or something, but it's got the word Cummins written next to it. So we know they've got one number wrong somehow and we can go and get it fixed up. Um, but it, GPS, yeah, and we're going to run through GPSs next week and then the week after we're going to use them to do surveys. Now, GPSs 
I'm discovering are surprisingly hard for people to use unless they're familiar with them. So there's something that we keep coming back to and have a few extra training days for and that sort of thing. But we'll, we'll run you through how a GPS works and we'll teach you how to set them up so that you actually get the right data into the GPS. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, and then other notes on habitat. You know, what are the main trees? Are they mallees? Do you happen to know that they're a particular type of eucalypt? What species is it? Is it a woodland? Is it a forest? Is it a, a, a scrubland? That's something like that. So little bits of information that you'll start to think about as you start to understand which birds use what habitats. It, it, it might be casuarina. Uh, that, that might be enough, just the fact that there's casuarinas there. Or it might be cypress pine. Um, <coughs> nearest water source sometimes is a useful bit of information. The condition of the vegetation. And then things like, is it flowering? That might be why there's 170 honey eaters in the count. Um, you've got whatever tree and it's in full flower and there's birds everywhere feeding on it. Um, so those sorts of bits of information set a context. Sometimes you'll take, and, and I automatically write date, time, weather, location, and a quick one or two word description of habitat when I start. As soon as I start writing something in that book, that's what I'm, I'm writing. And then I start with the bird species. But it just sets the scene. And along the way, you might walk past quite a few trees that are flowering, and you might happen to know that they're sugar gums, so you write down that they're sugar gums. And, and that be, begin to explain what's going on. Now, this one, just to begin understanding what's happening when we are, are talking about recording a location on a, for where you're doing the survey. The, there are two types of locations that we can talk about. We can talk about latitudes and longitudes and for those you'll be doing things like 32 degrees, 16 minutes, 14.8 seconds and, and that might be south. And you might have 186 degrees, 17 minutes, That's a Latin along. Now, when you use those, they tell you exactly where you are on the earth. There's no problem. But they're, they're sort of tricky for people to get their heads around. And they don't actually tell you a lot of information other than that one point. The, the one that we tend to use a lot more involves eastings and northings. And that's something where we get a, a grid reference. And that'll be things like 0, uh, 6, 1, 4, 2, 8. And then there'll be something like 6, 1, 7, 4, 3, 6. Those two numbers tell you a place on the map. But the neat part about it is they're in metres. So if I've got 6, 1, 7, 3, zero and six one seven four three eight I know that two meters and two meters they're about that far apart. I can actually see where they are in my brain. It it makes a bit more sense. So using these grid references can be a bit more useful in, in understanding. The the weakness is uh, um, that there's a lot of sites on this earth that have that exact grid reference, but there's something else that we need to have in here that helps us to know where we are. So, the challenge with defining where you are on the earth is, first of all, 
The Earth's not exactly round. It's actually a bit wobbly and bumpy. And when we come to drawing a map that fits over it, it's not so easy. So if you've, if you've got the Earth and we want to get a map of one part of it, how do we actually fit that map onto it? Or more importantly, how do we fit what's on the Earth onto the map? Now, some ways, people look at things like a bit of orange peel, and then they take the orange peel and they stretch it. So they, they stretch it where at the bottom of it, they stretch a lot more than the middle of it. And when you get a map like that of the Earth, you get the bits up the top are really stretched right out so that if you look across the top of Russia, it, it looks like it covers a huge area, but it's actually much smaller than that when you look at it on the globe because it's stretched right out. There's other challenges in dealing with how the landform actually lies. And we think of sea level as being something constant, but as you go around the earth on different sides of each of the countries and continents, it's actually at different heights. There's bumps and lumps of sea all over the place. And, and that is affected by how much gravity there is in all those different places. It's affected by a whole lot of other things as well. Then you've got to fit the, the bumps and lumps of the land onto the map as well and you've got to flatten everything down. So you can actually have something that's very steep fits on one kilometre of a map and something that's very flat fits on one kilometre of a map. So there's challenges there as well. Our ability to fit what's there onto a map has got better our ability to work out which line we're going to use has got better over time. The first maps that were done for Australia, remember the 1 to 100,000 series, the 1 to 250,000 series for Australia, came out in the 60s. If, if you were bushwalking back then, they were all to go. Little one centimetre squared was a kilometre and, and it was a, a real challenge to bushwalk. But they used to use Australian geodetic datum, AGD 66. And from that, you got coordinates for your position on the map and, and those coordinates led to a specific position on the map. No problem. You, you work across the map, you work up and you get the two coordinates. But in 1984, they had another projection, AGD 84, Australian Geodetic Datum 84, and that was more accurate. The problem is that one point on the old map is about 300 metres away from the same point on the new map because we got a bit more accurate with the, the way we projected it, but it shifted. So if I'm using my GPS and I've got my GPS set up for the modern datum, but I'm looking on a map that's the old map, they're going to be 300 metres apart from each other, even though we're talking about the same point. So that, that gets a little bit tricky. And then AGD 84 was replaced by DDA, geocentric datum of Australia, in 1994. And that's the one we use nowadays. And that's only two or three metres out from... AGD 84 on average, but it's still slightly different. So when you get your GPS out, you've got to tell it which datum you're using. Which map do I want it to relate to? And typically, you'd go and set it up like that. But I had someone came to me recently wanting to go to a point to do a survey, and they didn't realise it, but their GPS was set up in AGD 66, and the data point that I told them to go to was GDA 94. So they were going 300 metres away from where it actually was. There was a pole where it was meant to be, but they were going 300 metres away because they were mixing up their maps. So that's the first thing you need to know. We're, we're 
not talking let longs. There wouldn't be any confusion if we were talking let longs. We're talking Eastings and Northings because it's easier to see in your mind. A meter, a meter reads this way and a meter reads that way. You can understand what's going on. But we need to make sure we're all talking about the same apples. When the Americans developed the GPS system, they came up with a grid system that applies right across the globe and they called that the world grid system and they did that in 1984. And that's another datum that people use that's quite common on a, a lot of maps and common in GPSs. This one is fairly close to ADD84 and GDA94. So they all sort of muddle around close in the same part of the world. So if you're three or four metres out and you go to a place and you're looking for a pole, you're likely to come across it anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But if you're going back to the old system, you might be a long way away from where you want to be. So we've got different ways of indicating where we are on the wobbly old globe. Then we've got a whole lot of orange peels that go right around the globe. The problem is you've got to know which particular orange peel you're on. So we talk about zones. And fortunately for us, Air Peninsula, it's on zone 53. fits across Air Peninsula quite nicely, or even right over to nearly the border. So that zone 53 is great. There's only one grid reference in zone 53 that has that coordinate. But you could be going to zone 54 and be chasing the same grid reference. So you need to know which zone you're in as you head across Australia. So if you go west of Port Augusta, you're in zone 53. If you go east of Port Augusta, you're in zone 54. If you don't know which one you're referring to, you can be chasing things in quite the wrong part of the world. And that, that's a, a simple little thing to rectify, but just need to be aware of that. So before you write your Eastings and Northings, you might be writing something like 53H, because that's the particular zone we're in here. Next is... When we're um, when we're wanting to collect a position, in the past we would have to find a, a map and find the spot on the map that we thought was the exact point we'd gone to, and and we'd get the coordinates from that spot on the map. Now we can use GPSs. The thing about a GPS is it's passive. It just sits there and receives a signal. So the Americans have got, uh, I think it's 32 different satellites moving around the world all at one time. And at any time, there's typically 10 to 12 within the visual horizon that you would have uh, around you. And those satellites... They're sitting up there and they're sending out a signal. And that signal is going right around. And it's an interesting signal. It's a square wave. And atomic clocks are used to, to send off this wave and it's highly accurate. And on the wave is a whole lot of information. But the timing between the start of the wave and the finish of the wave is, is quite exact. And so... When you've got satellites up there, they're all sending out a signal and your GPS is sitting there and it's comparing when the waves are coming in from each satellite. And using that, it's able to get an exact position relative to that satellite. So those satellites, they know exactly where they are, and I mean exactly, to, to very small tolerances. And they're sending out a timing system based on a clock, an atomic clock, so it's accurate to very small parts of a second, millions of a second. So 
So it's the best clock you'll ever get, a little GPS. It, it's based on a very accurate timing system. And what it's doing, your GPS is looking at sets of three and based on the time for sets of three, it knows exactly where it is on the Earth. And then it'll take another set of three satellites and it'll average the position for them. And it comes up with little triangles of position that sort of fit over each other. And in the end, if it gets enough sets of three, it'll get quite a, an accurate estimate of where you are. The problem comes in that things get in the way of that signal and weaken it. One of them is um, mostly around water. So if you're under vegetation, then the signal coming in can get quite weak and the accuracy gets quite low. So out here, when we're in the open, it's usually plus or minus three metres, two or three metres, it's quite accurate. But if you're in the um, rainforest in Victoria and there's a hundred metres of tree above you and it's all wet and, and all sorts of things going on, it might be plus or minus 30 or 50 metres accuracy. So that, that changes. And if you're under metal, you're not going to get any signal at all. So sitting in a car is not so good unless you're near to the windscreen or something like that. Um, those, those signals, because you're not creating the signal, because the signal is coming to you, you need to twist around how you're thinking about what the GPS is doing. Um, and yeah, they used, they, they're quite accurate horizontally. So horizontally, you, you might have plus or minus three metres relative to your position. So what you get, the answer you've got for where you are could be two or three metres away, really. But it, it varies with, with conditions. The height estimate is prone to a bigger error. It's not as accurate. And so you end up getting a bit of a football shape for an accuracy. It, it's not as good for height but a bit as it is for distance. About 1999, the Americans switched off what they called selective availability. You actually needed a special bit of knowledge to get that sort of accuracy. Prior to that, they put a fudge factor in. So you're within 20 or 30 metres or 40 metres of, of where the point was that you got. But nowadays it, it's pretty accurate. The height one is apparently made that way because if you're using a GPS to fly something like a, a rocket and you're flying low over the land, when you go to go through a saddle, if you're plus or minus 30 metres, then you're, you're more likely to run into things. So, but on the whole, they're really good. So it takes away a lot of the unknown. It also means that um, if you're going to do bird surveys, you can mark where your car is and you can head off into the bush and you can actually know where your car is. <laughs> and you can get back. You can even do it for shopping, yes. Um, so that's really good. And you can know where the point is that you've got to go to in the bush. And the best part is you can actually have an area that you want to survey and you can go to the start point and then you can walk off and follow a route and go up 180 metres and go across 50 metres and cover off on the survey really neatly. And you can actually look at it on the GPS and see where you're going. So we can get you to do really neat surveys for us following a GPS. The key is that you have to take a spare pair of batteries Otherwise, when it goes flat, you can't find your way back to your car. But other than that, it's really good. So be aware. It's a really quick and rough introduction, um, and you can learn a lot more, I'm sure, if you want to. But we're going to teach you how to use these over the next few weeks and try and build up a bit of knowledge. And um, hopefully... We were hoping to have a GPS in each of the offices that people could borrow, but we just missed out on the grant the other day, sadly. But that's something where we as government apply for things and they don't really like us, but if you have a community group 
There's money out there all over the place for you as a community group to apply and get GPSs and you can have a set of them sitting in your um, town somewhere. So be aware of that. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to emphasise with your uh, field diary is that there'll be quite a few birds that you're going to see that you won't be able to identify straight away. And taking notes on that can be a key part of learning because it, nowadays it, it's very easy not to see another bird the same species again for months unless you go actively looking for it. And one of the starting points with helping you identify it is being able to compare it to a bird that you know well. And um, I've gone through and just listed off a bunch of birds and you've got them on the sheet there. And this is the size range from tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. If you sort of put them flat on a page. And our smallest wee bills, so eight and a half to nine and a half centimetres. And I've, I've got a wedge tailed eagle there. So a wedgie sitting on the tree, he's about a metre tall. So they're actually quite big. And then all that you see in between. Weebills, partalote is a, another centimetre or two bigger. Silver eyes, again, another centimetre or two bigger. And your fairy wrens, another centimetre or two bigger from that tip of the tail to the tip of the beak. And so when you go down, house sparrow, another centimetre or so bigger again. Wood swallows, um, they're ones I'm sure you're quite familiar with. New Holland honey eaters, again, pretty common one, 18 centimetres or thereabouts. Woolly wagtails, about 20 centimetres. It's a gradual change, but you can begin to appreciate that. That 20 centimetres is, is quite a big bird. Grey shrike thrush, up to a quarter of a metre. Blackbird's a bit bigger again. Magpie, red wattle bird, silver gull. Kookaburra is nearly half a metre long when you stretch them out. I guess it depends on where, <laughs> how far you're stretching. Ravens, Pacific gull. <coughs> up over half a metre. That's not the wingspan, that's just the head bill. And pied cormorant and wedge-tailed eagle. So gi giving you a, a comparison which you can use. And, and in your head you might just simply say, oh, it's about the size of a grey shrike thrush. Mm -hmm. And that's all you have to write down because later on you can check how big a grey shrike thrush is. And then when you're looking for your bird, you can make sure that the size range is quite right. So, little comparisons. And then there's things that we've been talking a fair bit about. It's about particular features, getting the names for all those features. We've gone through that and started to get some of the names, the key names. Thinking about the bill shape and size. If, if you're getting bills of a particular type, the number of birds you're going to have to identify shrinks very rapidly. If you can say that was a honey eater, you're down to 66. If you can say it's a honey eater on Air Peninsula, then again, you're probably less than 20. And so on it goes. You, you can start to shrink down the number of birds quite quickly. We've talked a bit about foot structure, the way the toes are organised, the different features of the toes. We've talked a bit more about patterns on the birds and individual feathers and you know if you do see those bristles around the bill that'll reduce down the number of birds that it could be. Um, thinking about the different feathers on the different parts of the body is pretty important. Then it, it's simple things like does the wing go past the start of the tail? Does the wing go past the end of the tail? 
are the primaries much, much bigger than the secondaries? Th those little things in a folded wing that you can start to think about now. Um, tail. Short, long, square, rounded, pointed, fish-shaped. There's a whole lot of features that you can start to talk about now and how it moves its tail. Does it move it up and down? Is it a sideways move? Does it fan? You know, the fan tail is an obvious one, but does it quiver the tail? Um, and, and there's a whole lot of things that you can start to write down. And then how it, how it perches is really important. Some birds perch quite flat, relatively. So you see them sitting there and they're looking quite flat. Other birds perch very erect. And there's all sorts of in-betweens. Um, and, you know, the obvious ones, are they climbing up a trunk? Are they descending a trunk? Those, those sorts of things. Uh, so these are all things we've talked about over the weeks. In flight, do they flap, flap, flap and close their wings? Flap, 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 close their wings. Do you get an undulating flap? Or is it a very flat, straight flight? Duk, 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 duk. Very obvious. Um, yeah, do you get glides in the middle of it? Hovering, circling, they're things that we're thinking about with our raptors in particular. Are the wings drooped down? Are they flat? Are they lifted? So wedgy versus nankeen kestrel. Do they push the wings forward? Or are the wings swept back? So start to think about a whole bunch of things. When they flap their wings, is it a deep, flap or is it a, a really fast shallow flap? There's things that you'll be watching now and, and starting to register in the brain. Um, the end of the wings, are they rounded? Do they come to a point? If they have a point, is it the third primary or the tenth that's the point? Which, which one gives it the, the, the longest part of the wing? Um, and when they fly, is it silent like some of the owls? Or, you, you know, crested pigeons that ooh, 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 as they take off. I, I can't do the noise, but you know the noise. Uh, or the clap as a pigeon takes off, that, that really loud clap as they hit the wings at the top. Um, then little things with, with a whole bunch of birds. So a duck sitting on a, a lake, some of them, when they get scared, they can actually just take straight off. They, they literally jump in the air and away they go. Whereas others have to run for two or three steps before they take off. And others, they might take 20 or 30 steps. Um, so there's, there's things that you can start to register with and, and that'll help you to identify it later on. Then recording your notes. Look, that didn't come out very well. Um, this is from an American book. Just a set of field notes. There's a time, temperature. Uh, there's things like the date, temperature, a little bit of rain noted, the species. There's a few extra notes for different ones. But then there's another step up. So this might be the first time you see a particular bird and you've just spent 15 minutes working out what on earth it is. So sit down and take a few notes on, on what you saw because they're the things that will stick in your head. If you're taking it from the book to your brain, to the page, back to your brain, you're actually, that's, that's the learning process and you're getting that information into your head. So this is talking about Things like um, where they saw it, what it was doing when they saw it, what it looked like as it flew off. So they obviously saw some white veils in the tail. And then there were key characteristics of it and, and its behaviour that they saw when it was on the ground. You've got a copy of this there. And then they're describing the habitat that they saw it in. So the type of information which can be quite invaluable if that's the one sighting you'll see of that bird over the next six or 12 months. 
and then you come back to it again and, and what do you record next time? Well, you might value add with a few extra behavior observations. And something like this, I don't know how many drawings like this there must have been done with shorebirds because shorebirds are all about subtleties, little differences. So they've drawn a nice picture of the bill compared to the head size. They've shown quite clearly that there's narrow bands of black and then white supercilium and then they've got striations on the head. They're noting all the different elements as they go across the body, even the leg colour. They've talked about how long the wing feathers are compared to the tail feathers. So a whole suite of notes that can help you to identify it a little later on where you can sit quietly and actually contemplate it for a while. And then I guess if, if you happen to be looking at an English bird book, you could probably identify this bird because they've given a whole suite of observations. Everything from a nice drawing of the head structure, which is pretty important in identifying their species, down to the shape of the bill and where it curves. Talking about all the feathers over the body and what's evident with each individual feather. And that can be important with the birds. You know, it might be a single streak visible in the middle of each feather or it might be a blotch visible in the middle of each feather. That can be the difference between two species. Leg colour, tail, a little bit visible, primaries, same length as the tail feathers. Comparative, larger than a dunlin, smaller than a ruff. So they've got a nice neat quite size range there. Um, then things about what it looked like as it took off, the key features that they saw. So there was a white rump and various things. The way it flew and some behavioural stuff. It, it didn't get flushed when a few raptors came along, but the Dunlins beside it did. So there were some things that you're starting to note that can help you next time. Uh, most of the time spent crowded but, crouched but alert. Um, Swivels whole body, so it, it, and the way it looks for the, the predator. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of page, it, it's, it hasn't got a location, but that could be the previous page, who knows. It's got cloud cover, it's got a name for the location, it's got a date, it doesn't have the time. It, but it does give you the sort of information you need in order to identify it later on. And you're also starting to learn. So get yourself a book and start just even writing the names down. But after a while you'll start to write more and that, that will be a, a real learning curve for you. Thoughts, questions? Um, camera. 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 <laughs> the trouble with cameras is you either are taking a picture or you're bird watching, there's very little that involves both of them. So if I'm going out bird watching, I go bird watching. If I'm going out to take pictures of birds, I take the camera. And they're two very different things because you can't do both. That's, and it's about you know, how hard it is to find something you're going to take the picture and what you're looking for when you're taking the picture is just the bird in the lens. Whereas when you're doing bird watching, you have to record it a lot more of this stuff. I tend to go bird watching first and then if I'm really keen I take the camera and get my pictures. So it, it is a, a, an interplay. Um, if there's two of you and we do have a lot of tag teams in this, um, particularly those who are colour blind versus those who are deaf, make wonderful teams when one can see and the other one can hear good outcome overall. So, yeah. Um, this, this final page, 
And it's something, if you've got a copy of this talk afterwards, you can just get a copy of that and, and print it if you need to. But while you're starting, this is giving you the parts of the bird and it's allowing you, you know, you can change the bill shape or whatever, it's allowing you to start to think about what parts are coloured and what are not and record the call and your little notes. That might be one way to get you started on the path. You might even put headings in. Just be aware that um, very quickly you'll just be doing it yourself because you'll know what you're looking for and you'll know the parts. But that might be a good way to start with with um, recording the information. Okay, um, so we're going to look at robins and whistlers and chats and things like that in a minute. So if you want to um, grab a drink and some food,